Welcome to Season 10 of Purposeful Empathy, a show that is dedicated to amplifying the voices of people from across the globe who understand that the world needs more empathy and are doing something about it. I want to thank all of you for watching. Our first 100 episodes garnered over 20,000 organic views. I couldn't do it without you. Please share, please subscribe, and enjoy the show. Welcome to a new episode of Purposeful Empathy. Today, I am joined by Bassam Khoury, who is an associate professor in the Department of Educational and Counseling Psychology at McGill University. He also heads the McGill Mindfulness Research Lab, which conducts research on advancing the theory, research, and applications of mindfulness and compassion. The global aim of their research is to make a deep and lasting change on individuals and societies by embracing new ways of interacting with oneself and other people and the natural environment, including animals, through the practices of mindfulness and compassion. Professor Khoury has published many academic papers on mindfulness and compassion in the leading journals of, of clinical psychology and physical and medical health, and his work has gained international recognition, having been cited over 5,500 times. Wow! Finally, Dr. Khoury has been recognized through multiple awards and nominations, including the Association of Psychological Science, Emerging Scholars, Rising Stars Award, and the William Dawson Scholars Award. Bravo, and welcome to the show, Basam. Thanks, Anita, for this nice introduction. I'm happy to be with you today. Me too. And I have so much to cover. I was just saying in the pre chit chat that we're taping this in January, it's going to go live in January. I think January is always the month where we reflect on what we want our year to be, we make our resolutions. And for me personally, and I think for a lot of us, given the last couple of years, I think we're trying to kind of intentionally move in the direction of being more mindful, self-aware, live with more compassion. So your work is so important, I think, at this moment in time. Um, let's start with the very basics, because I think yeah. still this word mindfulness is kind of confusing. What does it mean? And and maybe what it, what is its connection to empathy? It's a very good question. Uh, actually, mindfulness is this kind of complex word to understand because it has Eastern Buddhist origins. It's highly used in the West. So it's a concept that uh, people might a bit find confused. And I understand that it's not coming from one single origin. Now, if we look at the West, most of the definitions will include something with an attention, so direction of attention and awareness, so awareness of what's going on inside or outside you. In our work in the lab, uh, we try to ground this notion in, in the body, which make it a bit easier to grasp and to teach. So what I mean when I say grounding mindfulness in the body is first trying to not be caught in your mind, not be caught in the mental chatter, in, in thinking, overthinking, judging, uh, is this the state of, of being in your mind and directing attention to the physical body by noting just as sensations in your physical body. So noticing that, that the body has sensations, uh, noticing what's going on inside you, being connected to your body, and then accepting. So there, there's a process of directing attention from thinking, overthinking, analyzing, judging to the physical body, to the sensations in your physical body, Second is not uh, not kind uh, trying to inhibit them or trying to stop them, but accepting and integrating them. As, as telling to body, it's okay to have these sensations. I'm not here to kind stop them. I'm okay accepting them. I'm okay in integrating these. As inviting whatever comes through mind over body without being on the defense. Uh, of them. So that's a bit the notion how we can try to to teach people how to navigate the concept of mindfulness, which is complex by itself. And the connection to empathy is an important one. I mean, empathy, most of the definitions of empathy, and I'm sure you are, you, you are aware of, they try to put these two elements. One of them is cognitive. So understanding, understanding what is, what from where the other person is coming. 
And second is, is feeding this kind of positive emotion or feeding the emotion towards what the eye feeding these people. So there's an emotional component of being able to 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 feel the, the not necessarily live the pain of the other person, but being able to understand emotionally what is what is the situation of the other person and cognitively understand where they are coming from. What how mindfulness might help us is first, I mean to do that. If we are in our mental chatter, meaning thinking, judging, uh, jumping to conclusions, it's extremely hard to be able to put yourself in someone else's shoes or e even to kind of be connected enough to have this empathy of the experience. Because most likely without even noticing, and it's not coming from a bad intention, you are caught in your own story or struggle or mind or issues or plans so, so so you are overwhelmed by internal things then it's extremely difficult even if you have the intention the good intention to have empathy and to understand the other person it will be very hard to do it because of this intense mental chatter that most likely would not allow you actually to have this connection Second, the connection, most of the connection with other humans and even animals comes through the body, not only the mind. People might so much over value the mind. I, I use my mind to connect to someone else. In the reality, when we look at even the studies, we see that, that the body connects to others, meaning all the, the, the body language and body state that connect you with someone else. So if you are not even aware of your own body, because you are so much caught in your mind, the connection with the other person, or even animals actually, is limited. Uh, so being in your body, less in your mind, but being aware of physical sensations and in your body in the present moment allows you better to connect also to the body of the other person. Because these two bodies are talking, not only the minds are talking or connecting, also you are connecting to the other person via your physical body. So if you are aware of your own body and aware of the body of the other person, this allows you a better connection. I don't know if it, it it's clear a bit. Well, I love it because, you know, when I think about some of the work that I do is, you know, training for more empathic leadership and more empathic cultures in the workplace. I often say we are so unaware of how we are reacting at any given moment. Mm -hmm. The part of the first steps of becoming an empathic leader, for example, is to gain sense, a sense of awareness about how you are feeling, right? So this mindfulness that you're talking about of dipping into your body is like, you're talking nuts and bolts. Like you're actually saying, what are you feeling? Am I, am I, am I feeling uh, uh, butterflies in my stomach? Am mm -hmm. I feeling that my face is getting flushed? Am I feeling mm -hmm. anxious? Like, mm -hmm. and you're saying all of that is really important because it, when you gain access on how your body is feeling, then you can become aware of how that's changing the way you're thinking. That's, that's very totally true. And mindfulness, uh, even though it, it, it's this concept that can be complicated, but also we are studying it under two now different angles. The angle that we call interpersonal, meaning my own mindfulness, meaning my mindfulness of my thoughts, my feeling, my connection to my body, my ability to accept these sensations, these feelings inside me. And another concept we call interpersonal mindfulness. So interpersonal mindfulness is being in your own body, but also being aware of the other person state of mind and body. So noticing, noticing if someone, let's say, is nodding at you or someone is like, not, does not want to listen to you because they are not happy of what you are saying. Noticing the, the body expression, noticing their face, noticing uh, how they are connecting with you and mindful responding to them. Mindful responding to them, meaning not judging, not reacting, but being able to kind uh, respond in a kind way. So there is interpersonal mindfulness that is under study more and more and how to understand how this interpersonal mindfulness impacts relationships with others. Right. Okay. And so this is a perfect segue to the other part of the research, which is about compassion, right? Yes. So what is compassion? How does it connect to mindfulness? And also how does it connect to, to empathy? 
that's a, a, an excellent question. Uh, yeah, as you can see, the lab named it itself Magamitefulness Research Lab. But if I would say honestly, it's my Magamitefulness and Compassion Research Lab, even though it was easier to name it that way. Now, how compassion comes? Uh, and I mean, uh, again, if I go to Buddhism, the origin uh, of, of the, many of these concepts, they, they mention that compassion is a cousin of mindfulness. So, so it's hard to be with one, not with the other, because it's a cousin. And it's a very close cousin. And there are a lot of, of interplay between these two, two elements because they are important to each other. And we notice more than we develop mindfulness we need compassion. And why? And that's extremely important. Why? Because also mindfulness acquires this awareness, awareness of self, awareness of others, awareness of what's going on inside you. However, this awareness might bring some grief, might bring sadness, might bring even anger moment, might bring things from the past. Because more you're aware doesn't mean it's always positive. And sometimes people think, if I'm mindful, it's always positive. Not always. Mindful being being aware. When you are aware and in contact, you might it might come that you come to a trauma from the past. You might come across difficult things that you want or you don't want because the mind is storing and the body, as we're talking about the body, the body stores a lot. So if I'm so much aware of my physical body, things might come to surface, including a trauma. So now how to deal with it? Mindfulness is good, but maybe not enough always. Mm -hmm. Meaning I would need this, this kind of kind approach towards myself. And I, I need a space to 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 integrate and to be able to be with something that as difficult as trauma experience, sadness, grief. So compassion comes into play. Now, how to define compassion again? There's the Buddhist origins and the Western definitions. And we tried also also kind to to anchor a bit in more psychological elements so, so it's easier to practice. So what we try to do in the lab to define compassion into these four angles. So first angle is we call thinking, the thinking. So we need, we all think. Now we can think in a compassionate way or we can think in less compassionate way. And compassion is mainly linked when you are having a struggle or a difficult moment. For example, I failed an exam or I failed something that is important to me. So I can either think, oh my God, I'm stupid. I'm lazy. I didn't study or didn't do well. I don't deserve that. Uh, I'm a bad person. I'm a bad student. So I, I can go, go again by judging myself harshly or somebody else. So compassion can apply to myself, to someone else. Someone else that say also failed. I can say, oh, they are stupid, they are lazy. They, they problem. Or I can say, I did my best, or they did their best. It didn't work this time. Uh, I'm still a good person. I'm still a good student. They are still a good person or a good student. So I can either come with a judgment, harshness, uh, or I can come with a kind answer. This is more. This is the cognitive side, so my my brain, how I'm appraising, feeling, for example, a difficult experience. So this is the cognitive, the thinking part. Now there's the feeling part, which is extremely important and sometimes a bit more fuzzy, more difficult for people to access and understand. So, so how I feel towards myself. Now, do I feel hatred? Some people are extremely, when they make mistakes, they almost hate themselves. Do I feel anger? Do I feel disgust? Uh, do, I, do, do I want to vanish from myself or somebody else? So it can be again, so the feeling can be a feeling of of almost hate, anger, of disgust, or it can be feeling of kindness, of warmth, mm. of love, mm. of welcoming. So the feeling the which is inside you, is it directed in a harsh way, in a destructive way, or it's in a loving way? So it's how to be aware of this feeling. The feeling is more a sensation inside you. It's not like the thinking in the mind. The thinking in the mind is one thing, the feeling is in your heart. I'm going to interrupt you only because I'm I'm bringing this is what's coming to to mind as you're talking. Mm -hmm. I think about my day and I want to be productive and I work all day and it's yeah. eleven o'clock when I finally close my laptop. You know that because I was sending you emails and you were responding at eleven p.m. last night, right? Yeah. And at the end of the day, get into bed. And my husband's like, "How how are you feeling?" And I said, 
I was very productive all day. I worked 10 hours today and there's so much more to do. And instead of celebrating how productive I was, I'm feeling really upset with myself that I didn't get more done. So I'm thinking about what I didn't get done and I'm feeling upset with myself that I didn't get more done. So that's just like an example. So I'm like, I'm with you. Okay, two out of four, I'm with you. Yeah, so the compassion is more to, to saying that I have done a lot today. And the feeling is to send something warm. And the feeling is a bit more difficult because you need to feel it. Like you need almost to focus on the sensation. Sometimes people feel it towards the chest or the heart. Mm. Actually, there is, there is a study showing a link between compassion and the temperature of the heart, which, which seems very strange. But we, when we call it warm-heartedness, they, they said it in Buddhism, kind-heartedness or warm-heartedness. So it seems there's a link. Actually, the heart gets warmer a bit when you have this compassion feeling. So it's a warmth. It's a feeling inside your body. The third element is, is more easy for people to grasp, actually, because it's, it's very dark. But people like it, so most likely. Behavior, actions. So you can, let's say, again, you felt or you had a difficult day or you felt at something or you want to do more, you can take actions that are harsh, for example, punishing yourself. I, I'm not eating supper today because I didn't do well. You can do that. You, you can, some people punish themselves more physically. Some people self-harm. This can go up to self-harming, but can be minimal self-harming. For example, not eating supper or not giving yourself something nice or doing something that is negative towards yourself, or it can be actions that are kind. For example, taking a nice bath. It can be like something you like. It can be an example. Or giving yourself uh, something that you like having. Something that is helpful to feel good. And here it's extremely important not to go with what we what people name as self-indulgence. It's not about, okay, I'm having good, I had a difficult day, let me let me have have some some drugs or alcohol. It's doing things that are constructive. For you. So you have to choose. There is a a a kind um, a way to differentiate what is helpful versus what is harmful. Mm -hmm. uh, and and here again, you have to remind yourself in a way that we try to do it. Remind yourself if you are a good parent and you have a child who had a difficult day, as I come to you now, what action a good parent takes. They take, take, care, take care of their, their child. They might prepare them a good soup. They will not tell them, go, I don't know, and drink some alcohol. <laughs> or do, they, they will do something that is constructive, that is helpful. So do the same thing for what you say. Well, that's the action side. The last one that was not mainly as studied as the other one, and but it's still important, the interpersonal one. Meaning I how much I'm able to accept compassion from others. It seems easy, but many people, and there are studies showing, people might not accept compassion from others. People might feel almost threatened by somebody who is compassionate towards themselves. How much I can accept and take weight, lean on others when I need it? How much I can feel this connection with others when I need it versus feeling isolated from others? So if I'm having hard time, can I feel this connection? This connection with others will allow me to feel more compassion towards myself versus being isolated from others. Mm -hmm. Same thing in feeling compassion towards others is connecting to their own experience versus saying, okay, they're having a hard time. I don't want to talk to them. So again, the same thing applies towards yourself, towards others. It's it's kind of symmetric. Mm -hmm. And there I can think it's very, very linked to empathy, but it's a bit different. Uh, and don't take me wrong. <laughs> Uh, it's empathy plus plus, I would say. It's like compassion is this empathy, there is empathy in it, but it has a bit more than empathy with this feeling of oh, this kind of strong motivation. And sometimes actions to elevate suffering in yourself and others. So empathy has this main element of understanding, putting yourself in the shoes of the other, being able to get the feeling of the other. Compassion has also this kind of Blame has, has that I so much inside me and cultivating it is cultivating this flame in your heart. So much I so much wants to elevate mm. my suffering or the suffering of others. And sometimes taking action, not only thinking about it or feeling, but sometimes taking action to diminish at least the suffering of myself or others. But some that was a fantastic lay of the land. And before we move to another set of questions that yeah. I have, I, I'm curious because. 
you mentioned just before we got on our call that you were once an engineer uh, before you turned into this space. So is there a backstory? Could you just tell us a little bit about your your path to this work? Yeah, my path is maybe particular a bit because uh, as I was telling you, Anita, before our uh, our discussion now that I I used to be an engineer and uh, do computer programming, software development. I worked for more over than 10 years in, in this field that is extremely also competitive and sometimes harsh and, and very, very uh, business oriented. And, 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 and how I came back uh, to, to psychology, certainly I wasn't as much happy in, in that field. I was not fulfilled in that field. And then I was, going towards psychology as a different way of understanding the humans and at the beginning beginning of my studies actually i had i had heard about uh, this holiness the dynama uh, coming to new york to meet some some researchers and scientists to discuss about meditation and science i didn't know a lot i was this is 2004 i think something very early, uh, during my beginning of my undergrad uh, in psychology at Concordia. So I didn't know a lot about that, but I had that kind of, I want to go and see. And I went and I remember seeing His Holiness and seeing the, the meditation that is this, the traditions that are so much powerful and have so much impact on the brain, on science. And I started some practices here and there I wasn't practicing every day at that moment, but bit by bit, I picked up a more daily practice. That was 2006, 2007, when I started to kind of be, be practicing meditation every day. So this is how it, come, it, it came to me into, into my work as a clinician today, my research, is from my own practice and for more discovering in, in principles of mindfulness, meditation, and compassion in my daily practice. So it comes from a, a, a personal experience and seeing how much it impacts myself mm. and how much it can impact others. Having having witnessed that, having been trained also in a Buddhist center in Montreal, going to meditation, it allowed me to think that is, is something I want to integrate in my clinical practice, my teaching, my research, and every aspect of my life. If you're enjoying this conversation, I bet you'll love reading my book, Purposeful Empathy, Tapping Our Hidden Superpower for Personal, Organizational, and Social Change. We are living in the era of a massive empathy deficit, but humans are wired to care, and we can become more empathic with practice. And the more you do, the better you'll feel. Please visit your favorite online retailer and order your copy today. So all the practices that you've adopted over those last 15 or more years now, yeah. how has that changed you as a person? I mean, it changed me a lot. And it's hard because it's hard to pinpoint to every change because a change is a process. Sometimes people like change when it happens like suddenly. Like I go and do that and I, I suddenly become another person. It doesn't happen that way. It's a process. But there are moments, there are moments I remember where specifically at the beginning of the practice, uh, when moments that I felt that it changed deeply how I perceive the planet. Uh, it changed deeply my experience and relationships. Uh, and, and this change is a process. And that at the same time, as much as it, it changes you, as much as moment, I can be frustrated at my own practice when I feel I'm stagnating. I, I want like this change to continue. Then I understand that the change is a process and I have to kind of accept it and, and be patient. Because sometimes let's say, as I practice every day, let's say uh, in a situation, I lose my temper or I become angry or I express something and I say, oh my God, this is, this was not what it intended to be, what in Buddhism called white speech, for example. There's a concept, it's called white speech, meaning a speech that doesn't harm others, that's not inducive to, to harming anyone. And at the moment, I'm a human being, so I can get angry. And I say something, oh my God, this was too harsh. And I tend to blame myself. I'm practicing every day. How comes 
I do that. I should never do that. And I, I need to remind myself that it's again a lifetime practice. And even though it has been 15 years, I'm still a human being. And I wish I, I'm, I don't do any mistake, but it's not true. Uh, as the Dalai Lama put it in one of his, his teachings, he would say, if I don't, actually, I, I meditate to not to de- need to meditate. When I don't need to meditate, I will stop meditating. So if I don't need to meditate, tomorrow I will not meditate. But until then, I still see that I need to meditate. And actually, my meditation time is increasing because more I meditate, I see I need a bit more, actually. It's not sufficient. So more time you meditate after 15 years, you see, I need more time to meditate. Actually, I'm not meditating enough. It's not the opposite. You see, I, I need to double it. It's not sufficient. So you have the lived experience of having seen improvements in the quality of your life and the way you see the world and your relationships on a personal level, but then also all the research that you do um, is bringing evidence to the fore that we need more mindfulness and compassion in our in our world. What would you say about why this time in particular, we as humans, we in society need more mindfulness and more compassion? Why, why we need, I think... Um... I think the answer comes from diff- different angles. And every day when I see what's going on in the whole planet, just, just to look at, at human condition, the misery uh, in a human condition, the suffering, uh, the sadness uh, from suicide attempts to the condition of war, of hatred, uh, to... Uh, uh, to genocides, all these actions remind us that, unfortunately, the state of human is not as we would have wished for. And I think a new generations remind us every day that they are afraid about the future, and I understand them. Uh, they are afraid about nature, about the planet, about environment, about human actions, uh, about wars, about killing each other and we are doing that so and it's understandable we cannot be mindless about what's going on in the planet and what's going on is not like happening from somebody else it's somebody else doing it and we are innocent we are just watching it's humans we as all humans when we say we as all humans across the planet eastern and western we are contributing to that i mean it's happening so we cannot say it's like somebody else doing it and it's happening to us we are doing it it, as as sad as it is, so if we look at history, uh, I my opinion, and I didn't do a, a systematic research, but maybe I should. I think across humanity, across the millions of years that we we existed, we invested much more time, effort, money, energy, mental, mental creativity on on um, creating, developing, maintaining, advancing war. War machines, arms, things to kill people. I mean, we did a lot. I mean, if you look at how humanity, humanity invested so much and still are investing so much, so much energy, time, and there must maybe brilliant minds on how to produce these more more better ways to kill others, to destroy, to acquire, to to have more power, to have more more influence. And I don't know how much, but I think much less was invested on how to become more mindful and compassionate. I think so the investment is not equal. There's so much investment on that and very little investment. So when we look why people are not all, why mindfulness is not so easy and compassion is not so easy, not because humans are bad or they don't want, but because if we look at the history, we didn't invest that much on that. There is some investment, but we invested so much on the opposite of it. It's something we can cultivate. You can cultivate hatred, for example, and you successfully cultivate hatred. It's not difficult, actually. Or you can cultivate compassion and mindfulness, but we cultivated more the other one, even though we might not want to say that, but that's what we did. Because, again, wars and winning and that is more important for across a lot of time for humans or was more important, I hope it changes, than the opposite of it. But we have the choice to cultivate one of these. We can cultivate compassion, 
but we have to expect that also the mind requires million. It has a long time that it becomes so easy for us. For that, for that one, the Lama is saying, uh, we need so much to meditate, yes, because our mind, I wish, but our mind is not like that compassionate. Our mind is not like that mindful. If it is, I will not need to practice at all. But it's not, not because I'm not good or so this person is not good, because all my ancestors maybe invested more time in, in war and killing and destroying. And there's a difference what we see it also in this earth between men and women. And I hate to talk about sexes and genders here, but maybe luckily for women, it's easier a bit. I'm not saying it's it's 100%. It's a bit easier for women to have compassion. And we can see it in research, actually. We can see that there are indicators of higher compassion among women than men. And actually, when we do a study, we get so much females, we don't get males. And when we get males, they kind of screw up the data because they make everything not that much aligned with what we wanted. Why? Not because it's most likely because female across all this evolution spend more time with, with the children, with kids and, and nurturing. So they had this, this ability more developed than men when they were hunting, killing, going to war. Not because one of these two sexes are bad or that because, I mean, that's what happened. So we have to understand there are consequences. What we say, our actions, our investment, what we cultivate, we get. If a person cultivates all their lives to compassion, certainly they will get that. If they cultivate all their lives to killing other people, also they get that. It, it is what we do for that. I think across the evolution, now women have an advantage on that because they spend more time on cultivating that than men. But I think both sexes need to more work on cultivating. Uh, that state of mind and being in order to have a different future. If not, we will have the same. And I don't know if people want the same. We have seen what it's leading us. We have seen the First World War, the Second World War. We can go easily to a third one if we don't change, not only politics, but also we, us as a human beings. So we say it's enough. We, it's enough. we don't want any more of that. We want something else. That's my speech about it. Well, yeah, yeah I'm just about to say you're, you're an engineer and you're a research psychologist. And now we're talking philosophy and leaning into sort of even spirituality, I want to say. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. I love it. Um, if we wanted to ground um, the research that you do in your lab, you know, you went over the four ways of practicing compassion. Yeah. Um, and what are some of the daily practices that we could take on to to really cultivate this that's an excellent question so when we look at daily practices there are two types we can see two types of practices one we call them formal formal meaning i'm i'm giving some time to do that it's a specific time to do this activity and informal meaning i'm integrating it in other activities let's start by formal practices formal practice again i'm giving some time to practice mindfulness and or compassion, meaning I'm I'm like allocating this time only for this activity. Same thing as going to the gym. So if you want to, to be in shape, you can say, I want to go to the gym or I want, I don't know, to to give some energy when I'm doing, I don't know, my my cleaning or maybe a bit to, to move more in, in, in the day when I'm I'm going to work or coming back from the job. So the first type type is I'm allocating time. And must practice is, is meditation. I mean, there are other, but the main, main must demonstrated across research and, and Buddhist also philosophy and, and knowledge is, is meditation. And meditation is simple. It doesn't mean it's easy. So it's most of it start by sitting. I mean, you, you can walk and meditate, but that's the most common is sitting. So as I'm sitting now, but sitting in a more upright, upright position, being centered, being anchored in your body and directing attention to where you are. It can be directing attention to your breathing, for example, if you want to focus attention. So depending what you want, you want to focus attention, calm your mind, you just breathe in and breathe out and direct your attention to these sensations of breathing in and breathing out. So it's simple. I'm not saying it's easy. There's a difference between simple and easy. Easy meaning when people start to direct their attention, they start to notice it's so difficult. My mind doesn't want that. My, life. my mind is, is all, always talking. So it's directing this attention. So that is what we call 
in Buddha, we call shamatha practice, or it's this kind of focused attention. You can also be more aware. So without directing attention to a single object, be more aware of all sensations, feelings, thoughts. So what we call vipassana, being aware of what's going on inside your mind, inside your body, but not judging it, not reacting to it, just being noting it and accepting what's going on. There is the third practice, which is very related to compassion, is metta. Mm -hmm. uh, so cultivating this feeling of compassion towards you or others. It can be done via metta imagery. Many people do that. And there are practices showing that in research. You can imagine, for, for example, your child or somebody you love and this feeling towards this person. You can imagine them and this kind of forms in your heart. You can cultivate it, sustain it. If you, what, how much you want them to be happy, to be free of suffering, uh, to have a good day, to have a good moment. How much we want them to have a good life. So you can cultivate this feeling and maintain it. And you can feel this warmth inside you. You can direct it towards you, towards others. So, so these are main practices when you are kind doing formal practices. You can also walk and meditate. There's a lot in, in Buddhist centers. You can walk outside and just noticing a bit um, uh, the feeling of, of your body weight uh, when you are lifting weight from one leg to another leg. So there are different practices. All these are, we call them formal. So meaning I'm giving time. It can be five minutes, it can be 10 minutes, it can be one, one hour, depending <laughs> what you want, but to allow allocating time to just practice. Now, the informal practice, some people like it because it seems easier or maybe less time constructing, is doing it across your activities. For example, you are eating, which is an important, important activity. We all eat. So you can eat by, by noticing sensations of the food, the taste, the smell, the texture, if you are. So you can notice that. So we can call it mindful eating. Noticing the sensation in your body when you are eating. So that's a practice you can do it while you are eating. Uh, a practice you can do it while you are walking, for example, towards your job. Noticing how your body is feeling. Noticing maybe the wind on your skin. The sensation of, of sun if it's sunny on your skin. You can notice when you're taking a shower or a bath. Sensation of the water on your skin. So you can do that across activities in the day. I think it's good. However, when people ask me, is it sufficient? I always tend to say it's good, but I also prefer that you marry it with a more kind formal practice because it's like us going to the gym, it sustains a better practice mm -hmm. than just saying, okay, I'm not going to the gym, but I'm walking a bit. It's not bad. I'm saying, oh, sure, it's, it's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. But it's hard because the mind is so this monkey that wants to jump everywhere that really you need to train it. If it was easy, don't meditate. It's difficult. The mind is a monkey and wants Buddha to jump. So you have kind to work on it very much to have it just a bit still and to have it to do what you want it to do. So as you were talking, I was noticing a few times throughout our conversation that I was taking a deep breath, that I was actually mm -hmm. paying more attention to my breath. So I think that's one of those informal practices that you're describing. So I'm wondering, like going back, not to make this about me, but just to use me as an example, yeah. um, you know, that at nights when I'm like berating myself that I haven't worked enough, even though I've mm -hmm. put like a full day, um, the idea of like, you know, him feeling warmth in my heart, or letting my husband say, you worked really hard, you know, and letting him hug me, like those four things that you described, what are the benefits? So, you know, I'm, I'm speaking to the people who are listening and who are watching and are like, oh yeah, this all sounds really great in theory, uh, but I don't have time for all this, or, but I want to give them something to look forward to. So what these practices of mindfulness and compassion, what does that, how does that change things for people? What's the benefit? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an important question. Uh, I will talk about benefit, but maybe before talking about benefits, I think it's important to intention first. What do you want? So I, I ask people, because people like benefits, and I understand people like to see what other outcomes. And, and we are, we have a lot of research showing outcomes, but also you need to know what, what are my intentions, what I, what I want from these practices and why I'm practicing them. 
So if we look at, at studies and, and, and plenty of research showing both mindfulness and compassion, for example, helping in emotion regulation. What we call emotion regulation, meaning that we are able more to work through negative emotions. Because people, positive emotions most of the times are okay with. Some people are not okay even with positive emotions. But globally, when we have negative emotions, what are negative emotions, including stress, which is everybody experiences stress, uh, anxiety, when you start to kind to worry about what can happen, depression, meaning the mood when it starts to, uh, to go down. So these kind of things that we see direct impact, and we have seen across tons of studies, it's not like 1,000 actually. We see impact on stress, anxiety, depression. We see impact on social variables, social connection, relationships, satisfaction in relationship, satisfaction at work, uh, well-being, uh, happiness. So I can tell you there are a lot of variables. I mean, we can talk about it one hour. We can see we can see impact on, on cortisol level. We can see impact on sleep. Uh, actually, there are studies showing, for example, parents who practice it, had, children had better outcome at school. Children didn't practice, the parent practiced it. What happens that the parent who practices had better connection, better relationship, better parenting with the child, which impacted the child outcomes. Mm -hmm. So so certainly the outcomes are clear and are well established. Uh, it's not my opinion, it's not only my work, there are thousands of people across the planet working on that, showing impact on interpersonal inside you, meaning your stress, your health, your well-being, and interpersonal, meaning impact on, on the relationships. And what we call the third part is impact on the other person, mm -hmm. the third person. So mm -hmm. if you are in, in contact with your husband or your child or you, you, you um, student or your patient, if you are a, a mental health professional, so you have this impact on you, on the relationship and on the other. So that's extremely rich when you have three sweet kind outcome both you the other and the relationship between you and the other i think it's sufficient beyond it, what i i hope impact on the planet on our relationship with with nature with animals uh, was was what we perceive as impact uh, for the future but that's bigger a bit sociological impact I have one final question for you, Bassam. This has been so lovely because the invitation, I think, to me and to anybody who's been listening and watching is to imagine, for me anyways, this is my takeaway invitation, is to imagine if all the energy and resources that were devoted over the millennia to yeah. open warfare yeah. was devoted to mindfulness and compassion, what world would we live in? What an amazing question to ask and to visualize, right? So I, that's the invitation. That's the taste I have in my mouth to reflect on and savor as we're ending this conversation. So thank you. But the last question is, can you think of a time when you were on the receiving end of empathy, what I call purposeful empathy, somebody who was being empathic on purpose um, and what that meant for you? Yeah, I, I I would go with an example of my first uh, consultation in, in, in therapy. Before I become a psychologist, I went myself for therapy because I was not feeling good. I was at that moment working as an engineer and I have changed many jobs. I have changed big companies, small companies, medium companies, startups. I was trying to see if it's, I was thinking at that moment, it's a company. Mm -hmm. If I change my job, I would be happy. So I was going up, higher, down, all kinds of ways to see what kind of, of environment I'll be happy in, but I was not happy. So I went to seek help and I went to see the psychologist. And I think I felt, I felt for maybe for a few times in my life so much seen with her. And she influenced me because I became psychologist one uh, because of my meeting with her. So it's, it's a huge impact on me. Uh, I felt empathy, I felt seen, I think. I felt seen, I felt understood. I felt she understood me deeply and she had seen my, my pain. Actually, she, she told me something like in French, I can say it, t'es es malheureux comme une pierre. Mm -hmm. You are sad, I think, as a rock. I don't know if in English if it goes well. But I think she, she felt my pain and my, my almost discouragement at that moment that I tried everything. I would have tried but it's not working for me. And she pointed that what I'm doing is doesn't have any meaning for me. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm, I work in all these companies, but doesn't have meaning. 
So I think she had a huge impact when I have seen her ability to see, see through me and and seeing her doing that job i wanted i i told her at some moment i want to do what you are doing mm. it seemed crazy at that moment because i had spent so much time in engineering and i was not as young as somebody starting like uh, to switch and I had to switch from zero there's nothing i had to start my undergrad but i did it and i think part of that from her inspiration from not what she said only but from her being with me from who she was so i so much wanted to be her and i hope today i i, I didn't see her since a long time i hope that i'm a bit like her in my work I, I hope that that what she inspired in me is, is is be inspired in other people because i think she is a great and she was and hopefully she's a still great psychologist and a great human being and that what what made her so impactful it was not maybe big words but just was deep understanding of the other person. Mm. And that's what I hope that also psychologists today do that way. It's not only your training, your knowledge, but also how much you can impact others. There are specific moments if you are able to show this, you see the other person in their suffering and that really you have this intention to elevate their suffering. I think it can have deep, long lasting impact on the other person. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. And I'm glad she was placed on your journey. And thank, thank you. For you. I'm happy that she, she was on my journey. Yeah. I'm sure you are. I'm sure you are. And I'm sure your friends and family are too, because, uh, you know, if you found more meaning in your life and uh, it's changed, you know, your your composition, your well, you know, I, I mean, your whole journey. It changed right? everything in my life. It changed everything. Bassam, thank you so, so much you. for this conversation. I really appreciate your time, wisdom, insight. Thank you all for watching, and we'll see you next week at Purposeful Empathy. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for watching another episode of Purposeful Empathy. Remember, this show is dedicated to amplifying the voices of people from across the globe who understand that the world needs more empathy and are doing something about it. If you want to get involved, share this video, subscribe to this channel. See you next week. Thank you so much.